Good morning fellow mathematicians, welcome back to another video. This right here is going to be the conclusive part of the series on the Franz and Robinson constant and it's going to be a longer one, okay, bear with me here. So what we found out is that parameterizing the integrand is a good thing, okay. It brought us closer to the real solution that we want to have and now I would like to parameterize it even more, but this time in a very fancy way, namely parameterizing simply our lower bound of the integral so that we can vary it, okay? You can probably also do it with the upper bound, I don't know. Then what we are going to take a look at right now is we know that we can bring it back kind of to 1 over gamma of x plus 1, okay? This is a new problem right here, okay? So we have an integral of let's say from t to infinity of dx over gamma of x plus 1. This is our new problem. We have said in the last um, part that, well, it would maybe be um, of our advantage to kind of bring it in this form. Now we can introduce substitutions to actually get this to an integral of, if we let x plus 1 be equal to z for example, then we are going to have the x once again over gamma of x. Okay, that's our original problem. How does the lower bound now behave? Well, it's simply going to be, um, okay, uh, if z is x plus 1, if plug t and t, it's going to be t plus 1 to infinity. If I'm not mistaken, I hope I am correct on this one. Yes. Now, from, from here on out, it's a simple thing. So we know what this is going to value to after a while, okay? We are going to use Euler's reflection formula. We have talked about this before. Then we are going to translate our gamma function in a wrong way, okay, into the integral definition. And then we are going to be at the point where we have t plus one to infinity of sine of pi times x over pi integral from zero to infinity of, um, then we are going to have once again. Now we can't use t at this point, let's use, uh, let's use mu for example, mu, mu to the negative x power, e to the negative mu, d mu, dx. Now we are going to interchange stuff once again and then we can use the antiderivative of sine of pi times x times mu to the negative x power, okay? We are going to be left with an integral from zero to infinity. We went through this process already, okay? I, I want to keep it kind of short. e to the negative mu over pi. Then we are going to have the antiderivative of this thing. Evaluated from t plus one to infinity, antiderivative was negative t. No, not t this time. We are going to have mu this time. Mu to the negative x power. And then, right, we are going to have, okay, over pi squared plus the natural log of mu squared. Um, I have to think about everything I do, I'm terribly sorry. And other than that, we have the cosine of pi times x times pi plus the natural log of mu times the sine of pi times x. Right, this should do the trick. And like I said, we are going to evaluate it from t plus one to infinity. Integrate with respect to mu. Ah, oh, that, that's so much stuff to write. Ah, oh, there's so much stuff to think about. We have argumented before, okay? We have this infinity bound. Okay, everything is going to vanish on the infinity. That's a nice thing, okay? This goes to zero. Now we have t plus one. Why not simply plug it into here and see what we actually get? We are going to have an integral from zero to infinity e to the negative mu over pi. Now a lot of stuff. We are going to have negative and negative is going to become positive. Also, I didn't make a mistake in the last video. It was Gucci, everything was all right on there. Even though all we did was bad math, basically. Okay, then we are going to have mu to the t plus one power. Negative t plus one power because we have this negative sign. Cosine of pi plus t times pi times pi, okay, just distributing everything into everything, plus the natural log of mu times the sine of pi plus t times pi over, that's a long line, <laughs> pi squared 
plus the natural log squared of mu integrated with respect to mu. And this looks absolutely abysmal, right? Okay, let us do some simplifications because we can actually play around, uh, around with the cosine and the sine right here, because this right here is just a shift in the cosine and the sine. If we take a look at the graph, for example, this right here is our cosine in normal case and we are going to shift it pi units. Okay, positive means to the left. It really doesn't quite matter if you put it to the left or the right, okay? Meaning pi over two to there and pi over two to there is going to leave us with a negative cosine wave. So this right here is actually just a negative cosine of t times pi, okay, keep this in mind. And also we are going to have the sine wave right here, that's this one, and if we shifted pi to the left for example, okay, here and there, we are actually going to get this right here, okay, it's a negative sine wave. Meaning we can bring the negative to the front completely. We have a negative here and a negative here. Let's bring it to the front. We're going to get negative the integral from zero to infinity e to the negative mu over pi. And then we are going to have mu to the negative t plus one. Now, this is going to give us the cosine of t times pi times pi plus the natural log of mu times the sine of t times pi and all of this integrated with respect to mu in the end. Okay, I'm terribly sorry for the sketch right here. And all of this over our, we don't even need this right here. I didn't even put the brackets to the front. Pi squared plus the natural log squared of mu. Okay. This right here looks rather tedious and looks absolutely overkill, okay? But it's not that bad because this right here is actually a huge part of the theorem that we are going to derive and that has been derived by Ramanujan at first, okay? So what's the conclusion right here? We got something new out of parameterizing our lower bound right here. It looked like something that could be of use. And now it's our task to actually combine those two methods, those two parameterizations, one being down here and one being up in the numerator. And after we do that, we can actually prove a certain theorem. Okay, bear with me, it's going to be a long one, once again. <laughs> Together with the second part, in the series, we have gathered a lot of stuff already. So you see, if we parameterize this with just Z right here, what are we going to get? Well, we are going to get through false reasoning, some integral, okay, it's of this form right here in some way, plus supposedly some missing function, constant whatsoever of integration, which we just called H of Z back then, okay? If you solve differential equations and you parameterize an integral, okay, an integral is just a special case of differential equation or differential equation in itself, then you are going to get some function or some constant of integration. You, you know how this works, okay? You were watching this channel for a while now. And now we don't know what this thing looks like. And if we add another, parameter to this whole thing, we are going to get once again some tail right here, some arrow term, some remainder, and the function of integration. And we don't know if, if it is a constant or a single variable function or multivariable function after introducing those parameters, meaning we're just going to suppose that h is with respect to both variables. How can you find out constants of integration or constants of differential equations, well, you differentiate, okay? That's something we have done on this channel before, using the Leibniz rule for integrals and solving an integral using differential equations. And that's the trick right here. And that's absolutely ingenious. And this is how Ramanujan first proved this theorem right here. So Cornell linked me to some lost notebook stuff and like I said, the, the derivation of this whole thing is nowhere to be found. I had to go through this whole process on my own. Some ideas sparked in my head just because I have seen the main theorem. But overall, Ramanujan came up with this way, okay, of differentiating this and seeing what we get. Now, it doesn't matter with respect 
uh, yeah, it doesn't matter which variable you choose first to differentiate. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. That was a weird sentence. I didn't know how to say it properly. <laughs> German boy coming through. I'm terribly sorry for my terrible English. English. We are going to differentiate with respect to t, for example, at first, because that's the easier case. Okay, and that's going to be some outtake in there. You can find it on the second channel. Now, if we differentiate our h, okay, h is what we want to find out, so we are going to add this horrible expression on both sides, and now we are going to differentiate the summation of those two with respect to t. Now, del t of our h is going to give us the Leibniz rule for integration. Right here, we can't use the special case completely because our lower bound is with respect to t. Take a look into the description, there will be a link to the corresponding video. We have used this a lot on this channel before because it's something you don't do in the normal case. It's a really special case of the Leibniz rule, you could say, but we have to use it. Meaning, we have to take the partial derivative of the integrand with respect to t, it's going to vanish, obviously. Then, we are going to evaluate this integrand on the upper and lower bounds, okay, and then we are going to differentiate the upper and lower bounds with respect to t, respectively, okay, and if none of those are with respect to t, it doesn't quite matter, okay, then uh, we are just going to land at the special case for Leibniz rule. Meaning, infinity is a number, you could say, it's a constant, you could say, okay, it's a matter of interchanging limits right here, but now nah, it's going to vanish at the upper bound. Meaning, what we only have to do is to evaluate this integrand at our constant times the partial derivative of our lower bound with respect to t, okay, differentiating, differentiating t with respect to t is just one. Okay, coolio, we got rid of that. And now, minus the partial derivative with respect to t, it's a special case of the Leibniz rule for integration of this integrand right here, and this is where the outtake comes in, okay? Just take a look at the second channel and you can see how to differentiate this thing, it's pretty elementary and easy AF, but I don't want to bother right here, it's already a long enough video. This right here is just a function with respect to all three variables, and we are going to differentiate. What you are going to get out is something. Let me see for a second. So z to the t power over gamma of t plus one. I haven't filmed the outtake yet. Um, let me think what you are probably going to get out. So negative. We are going to get a factor of sine of pi times t over pi times an integral from zero to infinity. After differentiating, you have e to the negative z times x and then x to the negative t, negative one power integrated with respect to x. That's a lot of stuff to remember. Once again, my boys and girls, I have my notes at home. Oh goodness, why am I doing this to me each and every day right here? Now, what can we do here? We can bring this back to our boy, the gamma function once again, okay? Meaning, if we just introduce a simple substitution, let z times x, be equal to u, for example, equivalently if z is not equal to u, we can say that x is nothing but u over z. Differentiating both sides leaves us with um, dx being nothing but du over z. Now, up and lower bounds stay as they are. z to the t power over gamma of t plus one, and then negative sine of pi times t over pi, integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative u. Then we are going to have u to the negative t, negative one, okay. Then, okay, we, we have one over z, meaning it's the reciprocal, so z to the t plus one power, and dx is nothing but du over z. z to the first power and one over z is going to cancel out meaning we have a common factor of z to the t power. We can bring it completely to the front. That's something we can do. Also, this thing right here, like I said, this integral is the integral representation of gamma of, okay, in normal case you have u to the x minus one in some case to get gamma of x, meaning we have gamma of negative t. Now, what do we have right here? That's going to vary to a common factor of z to the t power one over gamma of t plus one. And also, here's where the magic is going to have negative sine of pi times t over pi. And then gamma 
of negative t. Now, Euler's reflection formula tells us that we can turn this into. Okay, if we interpret this part right here as one minus something, then this right here was actually one minus t plus one. Okay, this is this thing right here, okay? This argument. Meaning by Euler's reflection formula, this thing right here is just a reciprocal of gamma of this thing, t plus one. 1 over gamma of t plus 1 minus 1 over gamma of t plus 1 is going to be 0. How is this useful? How in any way is this useful right here? Well, if you differentiate some function with respect to a variable and you get a 0 out on the other side, well, that just means that our function has been a constant all along when it comes to this variable. Meaning our function is actually constant in t. Our big conclusion right here is that h of z comma t is basically nothing but h of z. It's, it's just with respect to z basically. So no matter how you change t in here, it's going to be our function all the time. So that's a really cool result right here and it's extremely useful because in the next step we are going to differentiate with respect to z was our other variable and then we can conclude something pretty dope. Give me a second. Now this last part is going to be a real shorty. So we concluded that h of z comma t is basically just a function with respect to z all along. Okay, It has been all along. And now we are going to differentiate this plus this with respect to z and z, z, and we're going to see what we actually get. Okay, so if we have this here, we're going to use the special case of Leibniz roof integration. We have a polynomial in z right here, meaning if we differentiate z to the x power with respect to z, it's going to be x times z to the x minus 1 power, okay? As easy as it is. So from t to infinity of x times z to the x minus 1 power, over gamma of x plus 1 with respect to x minus. Okay, this right here is just an exponential function. That's the only part that's really with respect to z, meaning we are going to have this from 0 to infinity. Okay, if you differentiate that, we are going to get negative. Okay, um, then we are going to have an x e to the negative x times z over pi and the only important part right here is this right here x to the negative t plus 1 power and all the other stuff okay doesn't quite matter what we have right here. Now what is this exactly? I want you guys to see something gamma of x plus 1 is actually nothing but x times gamma of x meaning this and that is going to cancel out. We are going to do a little change of variable because this next observation is quite important. Let we are going to substitute x minus 1 by u for example, meaning dx is nothing but du and we know that u plus 1 is nothing but x. We are going to be left with an integral from, if we plug t into here, we are going to get t minus 1 to infinity of z to the u power over gamma of u plus 1, I'm terribly sorry, integrated with respect to u. Also, our x to the negative something is actually nothing but x to the negative some function with respect to t. Okay, I want you guys to see this. Also, we have some negative sign right here. It really doesn't quite matter in this process. Okay, the only really important part on here is that if we multiply this x by here, okay? We are going to get rid of this negative one up here, but this in itself is just a function of t. But our h that we have right here is just a function with respect to z. Meaning it doesn't quite matter if we make a change to this f of t right here. It's going to stay how it is. So this is actually just the same thing that we had before. So this right here is just a function of f comma x z comma t integrated with respect to x. And all that's really changing is, okay, even on this one, it doesn't quite matter, lower bound is with respect to t, but 
our h is just h of z. This function in itself stays how it is. Okay, so there is no real change to this thing. Meaning we are going to get h of z, comma t minus one you could say, but since it's just a function of z, we are going to get this out on the other side. I hope you could follow me on this one. This right here is probably one of the hardest parts to follow. But here's the big conclusion. Something that we have solved before. We know that d dz, it's not a partial derivative anymore, it's just a normal derivative of h, is nothing but h. And we know the solution to this thing. I made a whole differential equation playlist. This right here means that h of z is basically nothing but some constant times e to the z power. This is what you are going to get out of this whole ordeal. Now, all that's really left to do is to find our constant of integration c. And for this, I would like to encourage you guys to consider h of 0, 0. You can find this in the outtakes. You are going to be left with, okay, this thing right here is going to be 0. It's going to vanish. And on here, you're going to have the integral of dx over x times this chunk right here, pi squared plus natural log squared of x. It's a really easy integral. You can find it on the second channel. But what we can find out is that z is supposedly just one, meaning h of z is actually nothing but e to the z power. I'm going to write everything out and after that we can apply this newly acquired theorem, this equation, to our original problem and then we are done. There was a lot of stuff to do. I recorded all of those three videos in a row now and it's a hard thing to do. It's, it's a really hard thing to do. I, I have to think a lot. Okay, see you in a second. I'm getting a slight headache now. I, I don't know why, maybe it's the air in here. So what does our original theorem state? Well, or our original Franz and Robinson constant. Okay, we didn't have anything up here. So how can we get nothing up there? So speaking in one, well, by setting z being equal to one. So we are going to take a look at an integral from something to infinity of, okay, dx in this case over gamma, of x plus 1. It's going to be a t down here. How can we get to our original integral? We just had gamma of x down here, meaning we have to introduce the substitution x plus 1 being equal to our boy, um, I don't know, z for example. Okay, meaning if we have x plus 1 then we are going to get t plus 1. Okay, we, we had derived this before to infinity of dx, in this case over gamma of x. Meaning, in conclusion, we are going to have z being equal to 1 and to get to our 0 down here, we need t to be equal to negative 1, okay? z is equal to 1, t is equal to negative 1. And you can place restrictions on this thing right here on all the values of t and z. Raminuten and Hardy and whatsoever, whoever, I don't care, did so. Um, for example, t needs to be less or equal to 0 and for um, z you needed to be greater or equal to zero. It has to do with this e term right here, okay, for it to actually converge. z is equal to one, meaning we are going to get e to the first power, e. It's a mother freaking e, okay, minus integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x over pi x to the negative one plus one is going to give us a zero. We got rid of this. Cosine of negative pi is going to give us negative 1, so this is negative pi plus sine of negative pi is negative sine of pi is just 0, okay, plus 0 over pi squared plus the natural log squared of x integrated with respect to x. Pi and pi is going to cancel out. Negative and negative is, be, is going to become positive. And then we are done. This has been a lot of work, my boys. Woo! That was so exciting. And this took me five days, okay? Getting to this point right here, proving <laughs> the difference formula for the front and Robinson constant is such a mess. Oh, my, my head hurts. This is seriously fucked, okay? 
I never got stuck with a problem this long. Not with an integral problem, okay? Most of the time I either give up or everything is going to be resolved in like three to four hours at most. But this thing right here was getting on my nerves and it was a lot of fun and I hope you had a lot of fun watching this video and maybe it enlightened you how mathematics is discovered or whatsoever okay that, that was a process of discovery for me right here and if you did enjoy this video please show your support by buying those t-shirts i created they are pretty dope in my opinion or support the channel on patreon you can also click on my quora question from time to time or buy the stuff on amazon i i i really don't care i thank you guys for watching and please recommend the channel to your dog to your sister to your mother to your grandpa to your bucket at home to your water bucket <laughs> Go catch some um, cats with your water bucket, just like in Minecraft. <laughs> no matter what you do, thank us for watching. Up until next video, have a flammable day. And once again, thanks to everyone who helped me <sighs> go through this right here. See ya. Love you guys. Appreciate ya.